All right, back to John 6. We're going to pick up right where we left off. But what we're going to do is, again, it'll probably take us a couple more classes to cover this chapter because this is where Jesus goes in talking about that He is the bread of life. Now, when He says He is the bread of life, not only will He supply our natural needs, but more importantly, what is the bread that you and I need? The Word. The Word of God. Folks, if you and I don't take in the Word of God and assimilate it into us and it become part of us, then you and I will be weak spiritual creatures unable to walk. This is what we're talking about. Remember in the process what we're looking at in these seven miracles. You got the new beginning, the new birth, then the establishment as a son, learning that you're a son of God. Then he empowers you to walk. Well, when you start walking, you're going to need energy, aren't you? He supplies all our needs. We're going to find out that when you walk and He's supplying you, here comes the tribulation and the attack. So He comforts us, doesn't He? He's there. And comfort doesn't mean cuddled you. It means He gives you support, strengthens. Later, the blind man's made to see perfectly, mature, perfected, and then raised. And this is the picture. But what we're going to do now is, talking about the bread of life, we're going to switch gears a little bit. <clears throat> When me and you are in this world, me and you are supposed to be looking to the Lord. In all things, Lord, lead me. We, we say this all the time, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord. Lean not to thine own understanding. Now, before we go further with it, what's the danger of leading, leaning to our own understanding? Well, we don't have any. <laughs> yeah, we're faulty. We're sinners. We don't have any understanding. What me and you think is best. In the last class, the rich man. Filling his barns up. What did he not know? That the Lord was flying all that. Yeah, but what did he not know about what was going to happen that night? He was going to drop dead that night, didn't he? So what was his understanding? What no good was it? See, we don't know what tomorrow holds. So trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding in all thy ways. What's all mean? Everything. All thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. What does it mean in all thy ways acknowledge him? Put him, first. put him first. Look to him to lead. To acknowledge him doesn't mean if I put a fish sticker on my car, I can go do whatever I want to do. <laughs> well, it doesn't. Look, I had a, uh, I had a really good friend. Uh, uh, he was an electrician, and he was just there was something different about it. This was years ago, and he was just. I mean, number one, he didn't he didn't cuss as bad as me and all the rest of us and all. But he used to say all the time about anything. He said, "Well, I go to the Lord with it and see." And he would say that about all kind of things. And I remember I used to think at the time that he was nuts. I thought, man, he's getting really out there in left field. I was lost, right? Mm -hmm. But I thought, he's really getting out in left field. He would say about, you know, I mean, just, just in general. Sandwich for lunch. It, I mean, yeah, just in general things. He said, well, I go to Lord with it and see. Later on, I started to think about what the man was saying. And now I look back and I can see the way he walked. And I, you know what I know now? Looking back. Hey, that was a saved man that was dependent on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Folks, he, his decisions, his, his demeanor, his everything about him, you could just see. He, I remember right when Hurricane Katrina, right after Katrina, if you had a diesel truck, you were in trouble. I don't know if y'all remember. Mr. Dodd, you remember what diesel did right after Katrina? Well, to the $5 a gallon. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get it. There was a panic. They ran out in Atlanta. There was a panic at all the places... And I had a 100-gallon tank on the back of my truck. And I'm in a thing. Where am I going to get? And he had one, too. And I said, you fill that thing up? He said, nah, I ain't going to bother with it. And I said, man, don't you worry? He said, nah, I ain't worried about that. And I said, but you got work to do. And I said, that'd be all right. I look back now. I know what he was saying. If there's somewhere I need to go, the Lord make sure I got to. He just exactly. he was trusting the Lord. Okay? Well, that's the idea we want to get from what we're fixing to do. When God feeds us with His Word, why is He desiring to feed us His Word? Huh? Give Him glory. How He benefits us. He knows what it does for us. Why does a parent, a loving parent, give their baby milk? Because He knows He needs it. That's what He needs, right? Does the Lord know exactly what we need? Yes. Do we know what we need? No. no. See, the Lord said He would supply all our needs, not our wants. You think about our wants. Folks, our wants are almost always bad for us. Seriously. The things that we want for, 
Do they bring us closer to the Lord or do they take us away from us? They, they distract us. Don't they? They're thinking, boy, I'd like to have this and I'd like to have that. And when I had it, would I be my mind on the Lord? Mm -hmm. yeah. See, the Lord, that's one of the reasons I believe with me and Mr. I was just told me, he told Peter to get rid of this and get rid of that. How was Peter going to serve the Lord the way the Lord had laid out for Peter while he's going to run a fishing business? That ain't going to work, is it? Set your affection on things above. So what he's basically saying here in John is the Lord's going to lead us. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to quit your job if you got a job or you got to go do this or you got to go do this. It's not all that. It's in your job let the Lord lead you. You might, hey, your job might be nailing shingles. Nail shingles for the Lord. Hey, Lord, help me do the best job I can today with these shingles and let me be honest about it so the people that I'm working with will see that I trust the Lord. Let it be where I can talk to them about the Lord and they won't scoff or laugh when I say Jesus Christ, right? Whatever it is you're going to do, do all things in the Lord. Well, watch how His Word will tell us His will. Okay? Now, here's the question. How do I know God's will in a thing? Little things. you got two choices to make. How do I know God's will, right? Let's start with John 7. John 7, 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Did Jesus Christ ever say a word that disagreed with his Father? No. Did he ever have a thought that disagreed with no. him? No. Next verse. If any man will do his will. Now look, our old English will is, is we, we misuse it. To, I should, we use it in a different manner today, don't we? If your will is to do His will, there's the idea. Now that doesn't mean that, hey, you mean i got to give up everything and go preach. No, I'm not talking about that. In anything you do, if it's your desire to do whatever God's will is, That's right? Yeah. Say, well, I want to do this. Well, there you're, you're wrong already. Yeah. I want to. Ain't what does the Lord want, right? Yeah. All right? If your will is to do His will, He, the man that desires to do God's will, He shall know of the doctrine. What doctrine? Christ's doctrine. Verse 16. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. If your desire is to do God's will, will God show you His will? Yes. Now, can you desire to know God's will for the wrong reasons? Okay. Are there men all the time that study to win an argument? Yes. Right? Uh, they had a fellow used to come to class and he would ask a question every time he came to class and he would jot down these notes and all this stuff and three or four different times after class he said, all right, I got what I need. I'm going to show him. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, what? what? You know, what is that? what's that got to do with anything? Yeah, that's just, that's foolishness. Mm -hmm. okay? So then it says, if we desire to know His will, well, do you and I ever go to God in prayer and in the back of our mind our will is to get our way? Mm -hmm. If my will is to get my will approved of God, I, that's, I, He ain't going to show me nothing. Mm -hmm. I can't go to Him and say, I will uh, do this, Lord, or begin to do this, and then say, Lord, you, would you have me do this? Is that leaning on the Lord? No. No? How is it supposed to happen? That will be done. Lord, whatever you want, your will be done, right? right? Just let me be submissive to it. Whatever it is, let me submit to it. Whatever His will is, He'll make it known to you. Now let's go look at some things that whereby we can know the will of God. To start, go to Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verse 2, David says, I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Has God magnified his word above even his name? What does it mean that he's magnified his word above his name? Do you like to keep your word? Oh, yeah. 
is your word associated with your name. Yeah. If you don't keep your word, what will your name be? Mud, right? Mm -hmm. If God said it, will He do it? Yeah. The Bible says in Amos, it says God did nothing without He first told His prophets. You mean everything in the will of God's back there in the Old Testament and the prophets? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would God say it first? To show you the proof. To show you the proof of His Word. To verify what His Word means. If God said it, folks, God's going to do it. So in knowing God's will, <clears throat> what's the first thing we've got to ask ourselves? Is this, whatever the thing is, I'll put this, whatever you're praying about or going to God about, is this according to His Word? Now, Will God ever do a thing or desire you to do a thing that's contrary to His Word? No. Never. never. It'll never happen. No. Now, does that mean that if me and you are doing something contrary to His Word, God doesn't know how to use that thing? Yeah, all things work together for good, don't they? Um, I'll give you an example. Jonah. Was Jonah doing God's will when God told him to do something and he didn't and went the other way? Folks, that was not God's will. Did God know He was going to do that? Yes. Did God use it as an example? Yes. Folks, God had a fish prepared knowing what He was going to do. The fish swallowed Him and three days later, God gets the fish gives Him up alive. Later, what does God do with that? He declares it as a sign of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't He? So Jonah was not in the will of God, but was the will of God done? Yeah. You know, I always think my granny always said, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way, but it's going to get done. She said that all the time. She also said there's Clara's way and there's the wrong way. That, I knew what that meant. It was going to go this way and everything else meant a good beating. Well, in this particular case, God was going to send Jonah to those Gentiles, wasn't he? Jonah took the long way around the barn, but where did he go? To the Gentiles. But did Jonah himself learn from the thing? Yes. So did Jonah's rebellion, did God use it to Jonah's benefit? Yes. That doesn't mean it was right. Could God have showed him without the rebellion? Yes. yes. A fellow one time I heard speaking that made a big long case about how Jacob, when he did what he did with his brother Esau both times, when he took his birthright and the blessing, that Jacob was actually in the will of God in doing that because he was the one that was going to come through. Folks, you don't think that God could have given him the birthright and the blessing without lying and stealing? Would God ever desire you to lie and steal? No. That's contrary to his word, isn't it? So even though Jacob was acting contrary to his word, what happened? It still got done, didn't it? Right? In spite of them, it got done. Alright, so God will never go against His own Word. So in the thing that you're praying to God about, if you know clearly that this is not according to His Word, you know, this is the kind of prayer that pops up in me and you a lot, I'm afraid. Lord, I, my conscience and my... It just tells me this thing ain't right, but there's not much harm in it. You ever find yourself talking to the Lord that way? I do. Yeah, Lord, I, I mean, it's... I, I, I just would really like to do this. I mean... And then we start justifying, don't we? Yeah. I mean, I've already spent four hours studying this morning, and if I could go do this, I would, you know. Mm -hmm. No, folks, let's, let's deal with this now. Go over to uh, John 16. John 16, 13. Let's read verse 12 first. <clears throat> John 16, 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Now Paul said that same thing, and so did the writer of Hebrews. How did he say it? You all remember? He said... He'll remember. I just take me, I kind of got a... Oh. Spot right <laughs> I understand <laughs> Paul basically said, so did the writer of Hebrews, I'd like to talk to you like mature believers, but you're babes. Mm -hmm. Instead of giving you meat, i got to give you milk, right? Yeah. Now watch here. Jesus just told these apostles about the same thing. Verse 13. How be it, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. 
For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Will the Holy Spirit ever speak contrary to God's Word? <coughs> no way. Then if a person today says the Spirit is motivating them to do a thing, no. well, see that what the thing is, is, right? Yeah. Is it according to His Word? Folks, if someone said to me, I'm going to go preach the gospel to that guy. And I said, okay, well, good. Why? He said, man, the Spirit's motivating me to do it. Well, amen. Get on with it. Mm -hmm. with, would the Spirit motivate you to do that? Mm -hmm. The Word of God says God would have all men be saved and come out of the knowledge of the truth. Who wrote the Word of God? The Holy Spirit. Then is that the motivation of the Spirit? How about when that man we were talking about the other day said the Holy Spirit told him he needed a, a jet airplane? Yeah, I, don't I don't believe that. that. How come? <laughs> We just read the scripture over there. Mr. I was talking about it. He didn't tell him, men, go get your jet airplanes and fortunes and monuments, did he? What did he tell preachers? Set all that aside and go preach the Word of God, right? Okay, now, watch the next verse. He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me. Now, that's important. Who will the Holy Spirit always glorify? The Lord. The Lord. Will the Holy Spirit ever lead you to do a thing that glorifies you? No. no. So the number two up here is, it will always be in accordance with His Word. And we could ask this, this question, is this, whatever thing we're wondering about, according to His glory? So if you've got something you're wanting to know what to do, you've got a choice to make or a decision, ask yourself, is this going to be to the glory of the Lord? Well, if it is, and it's according to His Word, do it. If it's according to His Word, so far as you can tell, but it's not to His glory, don't do it. If it's according to His glory and you can't find anything about it in the Word, keep praying. Keep waiting. Just wait on the Lord. Okay. Now, go over to uh, 14. That's the same. Don't do it if you can't do it for Christ's sake. That's exactly right. 14.26 He said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Will the Holy Spirit ever bring something to your mind that God Almighty didn't say through His Son? No. Will the Holy Spirit ever bring something to your mind that contradicts the Word of God? No. no. Then if a person says the, the Spirit's leading them to do a thing, and it's not according to His Word, ignore it. All right? How about the, the glory part? All right? The one that pops to my mind all the time is this thing about tongues. When you see these people today, the reason I know, almost every time I hear it, I know right away that it's got nothing to do with the Lord. When you see someone acting like or talking about that they can speak in tongues. Who is it always glorifying? Yes. Them. Then is it of the Lord? No. no. Folks, it's got nothing to do with the Lord. Why would the Lord want to lift that person up and glorify Him that He's got some special language that you don't? Does that make any sense no. to anybody? No. It, it does. It's to their glory, so just leave it alone, right? How about the person that's going to do something in order to be seen or noticed? Whose glory is that to? Yes. Self, can you do the most wonderful charitable work in the world and yet it be to uh, not to the Lord's glory? Yeah. Right? That's what most charitable things that are done today are done. Y'all know you see rich men. I remember uh, Ted Turner gave a billion dollars one time to the United Nations. Y'all remember that? Now, number one, would you want to give your money to the United Nations? I don't want no part of that. I'm like them old timers used to see in the country. Get us out of the UN. You'd really? see them signs out in the country. Yeah, really. yeah, I'm with you. Get us out of there. Um, but this thing about giving, why would Ted Turner give that kind of For money? His glory. Yeah, how come I even know about it? I don't know Ted Turner. I do. Yeah. And that's true. Well, you do, okay? <laughs> you know why I know about it? I saw it on CNN. Who owned CNN at the time? Y'all see what that's about? Okay. So it, we got to have to be real careful with these things. Now, look at uh, 1526. But when the Comforter is come, who I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Who's the Holy Spirit going to bear witness to? The Lord. The Lord. 
Folks, would the Holy Spirit ever bear witness to a human being? No. No way. Would the Holy Spirit ever bear witness to someone coming in Christ's name who Christ didn't send? No. Would the Holy Spirit ever contradict the will of the Father or the Son? No. No, no way. Okay, go to 17, 8. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, they have believed that thou didst send me. Did the words of Jesus Christ agree with his fathers completely? Mm -hmm. Did the words of the Holy Spirit agree with both completely? Yes. What should our words do? Same, same, same thing. thing. Would the Father be, through the Son, motivating you in any way to do anything contrary to something no. that's in this word? No. no. All, right. All right. So we've done that one. One more. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. First right, Corinthians fourteen thirty three. Now this is interesting to me that this is in the chapter talking about spiritual gifts and tongues in particular. And in verse thirty three he says, "God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints." Now. Is God the author of confusion? No. Is it confusing to say one thing and do another? Yes. Is it confusing to say two different things? Yeah. Then is God the author of confusion? No. And we're going to find that His words are always going to be the same. Okay, let's go look at another portion of this. Go to 1 Corinthians 2. Now He said, Jesus Christ said, that He, Jesus Christ, only spoke things that agreed with the Father. And he said he did things that glorified the Father, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And he said the Holy Spirit would only speak of the things that glorified Christ and would only glorify Christ. Well, if Christ is speaking the same things the Father says, and the Holy Spirit is speaking what the Son says, then the Holy Spirit is speaking what the Father says, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what Catholics are called at the Trinity. But I don't believe the way they believe the Trinity. They say it's all the same. No, they're not the same. We, we talked a while back about a chord. Remember the scriptures say a three chord? Huh? Yeah, three. It's hard to break. All right, three together working as one, right? That's what we've got here. They're a perfect accord. Now, it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, Paul said, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Why didn't Paul use excellent speech or wisdom? Who would that have glorified? Oh, oh, Y'all ever heard somebody uh, talk and they said, boy, he is a wonderful speaker. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a, a, a somewhere one time and somebody was telling me about a conference they had been to and they said, he is a wonderful speaker. And I said, real good. What did he teach you? He said, I don't know. <laughs> huh? <laughs> right? We, we've been around people like yes. that, haven't we? Um, what do they call those uh, motivational speakers? Folks, some of them people can get you whipped up into a frenzy, yeah, can't really? they? Man, they get you fired up, ready to go. I remember I had a, a friend one time and he wanted me to go to this, uh, way back when I was in the Navy, he wanted me to go to an Amway meeting, right? And I said, man, you don't strike me as an Amway kind of guy. You, you wouldn't, didn't have gumption or whatever. He said, I don't guess I am, but man, I heard this guy speak, and I just, I, I, I got to do something. That guy was a big, big, big um, Amway guy. You know, he, he knew how to do it. Well, Paul says in verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save or accept Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul, was Paul doing the will of God in his preaching? Yes. And what was the only thing Paul wanted to center his preaching on? So I could ask myself about something. How does this center on Christ crucified? Now what do I mean by that? Say this thing that I'm going to the Lord. Lord, is this your will that I do this or not? Well, let's see. As far as I can tell, it's in accordance with your word. And usually the things we're most gray on are because we, we're not familiar with his word. Mm -hmm. and we don't know it. But Lord, I can't see in your word whether I should do this or not. 
Now, it looks to me like it's going to be to your glory. Say, okay then, how will this thing bring, bear witness to Christ crucified? You, you'll get your answer real quick. Yes. Just whatever it is, how will it bear witness on Christ crucified? Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I can't even think of one. Well, let's go on maybe one will come. Alright, let's go to uh, Acts 4. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Where, what's the only name under heaven that men can be saved by? And everything we do, we should say, is this going to positively affect that name or negatively affect that name? Now this is where our behavior comes in the most, doesn't it? You know, we all sit and say, well, look, I know my sins are forgiven. Amen. My sins are forgiven. The penalty's paid. But do we still live in a world where our sins are visible to the world? Yeah. Then what do we need to be aware of? Yeah. How our sins, though they're paid for, how do they affect the name of Jesus Christ? So it's not only how does this sinner on Christ crucified, but how does this bear on his name? Y'all know, quick as somebody, uh, I'm trying to think. Remember Tim Tebow, right? Always praying and, look, in my estimation, it would appear to me he was doing a lot of what he was doing for attention. He could have prayed in the locker room, Rob, but he'd come out and do it on the middle of the field, whatever. Maybe he wasn't, I don't know. But I do know this. The world was watching Tim Tebow, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Did the world like Tim Tebow or hate him? I don't know. Oh. Say it. Half of them loved him, half of them hated him, didn't he? Which half hated him and which half loved him? Religious people loved him. The worldly people hated him, didn't they? Yeah. Now, there's no... Get, you can't separate. We just separated the religious from the worldly, right? Yeah. You can't separate those two saved and unsaved. No. We're talking about two different things, yeah. aren't we? Mm -hmm. But what was the unsaved world watching Tim Tebow for? I remember he wait for him to fall. Wait for him to fall. Yeah, yeah. He made a comment one time about Carrie Underwood. Y'all, y'all ever seen the country singer Carrie Underwood? Oh yeah. yeah. She's a good-looking girl, right? Yeah. He made a comment about her. You know what I heard somebody on one of the football shows say? Yeah, see there, there's Tim Tebow. Yeah. Right? Why'd they say that? This, make him fall. Yeah. Look, this guy here got gotten away with murder. If you research this guy, a linebacker, he murdered somebody 20 years ago and got away with it. Yeah. And he said, yep, see there? What he's really saying is, here's a guy claiming he's better than me, that he just proved he ain't better than me. Yeah. Well, then don't go claiming you're better than anybody. Yeah. And people have come to you all the time about, somebody told me about a preacher once said, you know that guy had adultery. Well, that's that guy's business. It, well, it ain't got nothing to do with his message. That's that guy's business. Yeah. I got to focus on my business, right? Yeah. Or you know that guy stole something. Well, that's between him and the Lord, isn't it? All right, what we're talking about right now is knowing God's will. And how do I know if the thing I'm going to do should be done or not? How do I know which way to go? What do you do if you've got two things and they all seem to line up? You go you keep going to the Lord with it, right? All right, let's say you've got some... Uh, and I got, let's say i got 50 extra dollars and i got to figure out what am I going to do with this? All right? So I, I, want to, I want to give this to someone to help. I'm just using this as an example. Should I give it to a lost person or a saved person? I want to be giving it to a saved person first, right? But, I know what Chris means. What if I got a lost person and then giving it to him, I preach the gospel to him? Well, if that's my motivation, do it. What if I want to give it to the most pitiful, despicable looking lost person in the whole world of homeless or whatever in front of a bunch of people? That's to my glory in it. What if I've got $50 and I've got a brother or sister in Christ that needs something? Then you help them. What if I've got $50 and I've got a brother or sister in Christ that wants something and don't want to work? Don't give it to them. You're not helping them. You're fueling that, that something that's contrary to God's Word. 
what if I've got a brother or sister in Christ that doesn't need anything and's got fifty dollars? Should I look at it and say, now how can I get this fifty out of it? No. I can say, hey, I've got fifty extra too. Why don't me and you put our fifty together and go Give help so and so? Right? Hey, all I'm trying to do, I'm using charity as an example, that public charity like that, because when you and I do a thing, it's gonna bear on the name of the Lord, isn't it? Okay. It's a, there's a perception. So then we need to always ask ourselves, is this according to His Word? Okay? And it always has to be. Is this according to His glory? Is this going to promote the cross or is it going to take away from the cross? When someone comes to you with something, folks, bring up the cross. Just bring up the cross and then watch. You'll get your reaction. You'll know real quick. Hey, you've got something you're thinking about doing? I, Look, we had a, a guy a while back. Y'all remember Julian came, right? The guy was going over to Russia. Um, Julian came and he want, he come over to Bible study and uh, he talked about it. And I said, yeah, you can come on over and talk. I knew why he wanted to come talk to us. Look, the man leads his family here and goes over there and preaches the gospel. Well, there ain't but one way he's going to be able to do that. That's if we help him, right? And Paul told us we need to do that. But the first thing you ask yourself, I say, okay, now do I want to help this man? So I say, well, is helping a man who's going to go preach the gospel according to God's word? Yes. Next question is, is this to his glory? Well, the only way I'd know if it was his, his glory or not was to know what that man's going to say about the Lord, isn't it? So what's the next question you do? You say, well, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. And Julian said, brother, we're just going over there preaching the gospel to these folks. And I said, okay, that sounds good. I said, what, what is the gospel? Right? His next question is, he said, well, the gospel is that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Not my sins and your sins only, but the sins of all those Muslim people over there that we're told to hate, that the world says they can't be saved. Forget about them. He said he died for their sins too, and even they can be saved, and I've seen it. Now my gut told me, okay, I got the right guy to help here. Mm -hmm. Next question is, how does this center on Christ crucified? I said, well, what is y'all do? Y'all going over there and building schools and digging wells and all? He said, no, brother, we're meeting in people's basements and preaching Christ crucified to them. Okay, now I'm in line with the Word of God. Last one here is, how does this bear on his name? You know, a fellow said one time, someone said about uh, how do uh, people in foreign countries, they were going to some island as a missionary down in Brazil or somewhere like that. And he said, what's those people's perception of, uh, of Americans down there? And the guy laughed. He said, well, what would be your perception if people come down there dressed half naked and got drunk and had sex on the beach? He said, what would your perception be? Mm -hmm. Well, then how does that bear on the American name? Well, not too good. What would your perception be if someone had said they were a missionary and they were going to a foreign country and milking them out of money or selling them survival food or packets or trinkets and Folks, that happens, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So you ask yourself all these questions. When talking with, with Julian in this case, every one of these questions it kept coming back to answer, yeah, you can help this man for sure. Hey, okay? now let's look at the last one, how we know. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> Me and Lexi went to eat one time out on the causeway. And we met uh, Ron Lafitte, who was coming through town from Mexico, and he, he wanted to stop by. So I said, yeah, we'll meet you. And we met him out on the causeway at one of the restaurants. And when we come out of the cause, out of the restaurant, there was a whole pack of uh, motorcycles out there, Harleys. I, look, I used to have one. I like Harleys. I was looking at them. I admire a pretty Harley. I was looking at them, and if y'all know anybody that's in the Harley Davidsons, what do they like to do above all things? Talk Even about their talk Harley. About them. More than ride them, they want to talk about them. That's why you got to wear the clothes, get the tattoos, you got to do everything, right? Mm -hmm. So you can introduce the topic, and then you can talk. We were standing there talking with Ron, and this guy saw me looking at those Harleys. Here he come. He come straight beeline for me. So I saw you looking at them bikes. You like them, don't you? I said, yeah, that's a nice bike there. He said, yeah, that one's so-and-so's. It's got this, and it's got this, and that one's his. But that one's mine, and boy, he started. Yeah, it's got this, and I'll put this cam in it, and that in it, and it'll do this, and it'll do that. And he would not shut up. <laughs> Lexi will tell you, she was with me. He, we were out there in the boiling hot sun. This was last summer, and this guy was going on and on and on. And all I was thinking of is, I need, you know, I need to talk to him about the Lord. There's a chance. So I'm waiting on him to be quiet. He wouldn't be quiet. 
folks, I, y'all know I got some kind of a social disorder with small talk. I don't. So this man's talking, and he had me backed up against the van like this, and he was a close talker. You know, <laughs> your close talkers worry me to death, right? Yeah. And he was close talking me, and I was anyway. Finally, there was a. He stopped to get a gas for there, and I said, "Hey, let me ask you something." He said, "Yeah." I said, "How many people that ride those bikes believe on the Lord Jesus Christ?" And the man took a step backwards. Uh -huh. As soon as I said the name Jesus Christ, step backwards. And he said, well, uh, a lot of them doing on. I said, what about you? He took a couple <laughs> more back. He, he walked me right up into that van and I said, Jesus Christ. And we switched gears and went back the other way. Uh -huh. Now, what happened? <laughs> I said a name that was offensive to that man's spirit. <laughs> it's offensive to the spirit of every lost person. Person. Right. Even those that are faking salvation, it's a it's a harsh offense to them. Yeah. Now, why do I say that? Why does that name have this effect? We just read it in Acts 4. Because there's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. You can talk about the Pope. You can talk about the preachers. You can talk about Billy Graham. You can talk about anybody you want and Satan does not care. You say Jesus Christ and you catch the attention of one of his minions. They listen. They check it out. What's this guy going to say? You say, well, you know, Jesus Christ, he, he died on the cross in order that I could, you know, live like him. And I set my life an example after him. And I patterned myself after him. And, I, you know, I do the best I can. And I, I you know, I, he's, that's, I'm, you know that he's my example. Had minions listening. He said, okay, I don't need to bother him. He's preaching our gospel. Right? Another guy says, Jesus Christ, one of Satan's spirits listens. He go, oh, what is it? And it's nothing but just a little old private in his administration. That little old private spirit listens and said, well, there was the name. It's almost like, remember, uh, uh, Rumpelstiltskin? Say it three times and he appears. Say Jesus Christ once and you've got the attention of the spiritual realm. Stop, let's see what he's going to say about him. Say, well, you know, Jesus Christ, he, he, was, a, you know, he was a prophet. He died on the cross and, you know, he... He's really what we ought to be. What would the Spirit say? No problem. Leave him be. Let him go. He's doing, he's, he's doing our work. Yeah. He's one of our ministers. How about a guy says, Jesus Christ died on the cross. And bingo, here comes, heard that cross. And dying, when the private don't come for that, you get a spiritual corporal or a sergeant in Satan's army. And they're listening. Uh-oh. Jesus Christ died on the cross. If you will just quit doing, you quit smoking and turn over your life to the Lord and ask Him into your heart and walk the aisle, God Almighty will save you. And that spirit leans back and says, okay, boys, he's preaching our gospel. He fella somewhere gets a chance to speak in front of a group of people and there's an audience of 500 people. And the man's up there talking and he says, Jesus Christ. And boy, you get a corporal, uh, ain't going to do it here, a sergeant. You get a lieutenant shows up. Somebody a little higher rank, more power, more authority. Spiritually working for Satan shows up to listen. You've got a chance to influence a lot of people, don't you? You get up there and you say, Jesus Christ uh, is the only reason, whatever subject you're speaking on, Jesus Christ is the only reason I'm able to talk to y'all today because I'm a sinner that ought to be dead and in hell but jesus christ died to pay for my sins and the lady over on the right over there will start coughing and gasping for air a man in the third row has a kidney stone attack the lights go out folks this is i mean i'm being honest with y'all this is how it works if it's one-on-one -on -one, you're talking to someone one-on-one -on -one, you get a chance to talk to him you said hey uh you know what do you know about the lord jesus christ watch and see if that person goes backwards like that, you know you're not dealing with a saved person. That name just pricked their spirit. Mm -hmm. Not only did it prick their spirit, but here comes the other spirit to work, right? You're in a spiritual battle. What is your only offensive weapon? The Word of God. And what does it say you're going to have to do? Stand. Stand and pray and watch. He, I was teaching a class one time. Um... It, over at a nursing home and I had a trouble with these ladies that kept interrupting that it, you wouldn't believe what they'll do the employees at these places with the links they'll go to, to and they don't even know they're doing it they're not being mean the things they'll go to to disrupt and, and to destroy a class they had one there and I believe this lady was just being me she hated me but she was yelling across the room at another one of what they had been doing that weekend and I get so mad on the inside, you know, you want to just think, man, this is the Word of God. You know, 50 years ago, at least people would be quiet and have respect for it. 
And I just thought to myself, just calm down, just be quiet, everything will be fine, they're going to be able to hear you. And as soon as I just said that, I said, Lord, just help me through this. And when I said, Lord, help me through this, guess what happened with that lady? She she Huh? No, her cell phone rung and she stepped outside the door. It was over. She was gone. Just that quick. Yeah. Somebody said, oh, that, come on now, that's a coincidence. You can do nope. whatever you want. I don't care. See, when you it speak, still happens. it happens. It happens like that all the time. When you speak in the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to get the attention of Satan. Satan cannot read your mind. But what you say about Jesus Christ is what's really going to determine what happens next. When you go out and you're going to talk to someone about the Lord, or you're in a conversation with someone about anything, when you bring up the Lord, their reaction will tell you exactly how to approach them. Sometimes you bring up the Lord. Hey, Wayne told me a while back he met some guy and said he was talking to him. He said, man, it was just a pleasure. He said, I tried to talk to him, preach the gospel to him, and that man told me the gospel. Mm -hmm. He started telling me about that's a pleasure. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you said Jesus Christ, that man didn't start going backwards. Mm -hmm. He wasn't dodging your sword, right? You don't need your offensive weapon on that man, do you? See, you can immediately meet a believer and there's some type of a, you can't rapport. even, there's a rapport between you. When you have two people that are unsaved and one of them gets saved immediately, there's contention between them. This is the Spirit of God at work. And you and I can always know God's will based on these things. And then there's one more here we're going to cover. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. But charity is a, is a godly love. Now, Paul said that he could do all these wonderful things in the name of Christ, and yet if it was not in charity, what was it? Racket. Just racket. You know, if you bought a... Uh, what's that real expensive violin? Strat Stradivarius? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You brought a $10,000 Stradivarius in there, the finest instrument you could buy. If you gave it to me, what would it sound like? Ukulele. It would be horrible. It would be racket, <laughs> wouldn't it? Honest and left. Yeah. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah. It would be horrible, though, wouldn't it? Why? Because you can't play. Because I can't play. Well, if you and I are trying to do something that we think is the will of God, and yet God is not behind it, then godly love and God's spirit is not behind that thing. It's going to be a bunch of racket. Guarantee you. There will be times when you get to speak to someone about the Lord, and you'll leave from talking to them, and you'll sit down in your car, and you feel real good about it. Nothing ever comes of that, I've noticed. Just nothing comes of it. There'll be times when you leave there and the first thought is, Lord, I can't believe how inadequate I am about this. Lord, I can't. I, I fouled it up. I know I should have said this and I should have said that and I didn't. And that's the person you'll hear from again that got something. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Verse 2. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. Boy, this is one that'll get you. And all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. This is one of the verses right here that really cut me to the quick when it comes to uh, different doctrines. He, we, we were all taught that the core, the epitome of the certain doctrine is to know the mysteries. And we get a chance to talk with someone, what would we always want to bring up? Well, do you know the difference between this and that? Do you know the mystery of this and why? We want to bring that stuff up and elevate ourselves, right? Sure, yeah. look, I know. I got the key, even if it was just to get their attention or captivate them and all. He says, though I understand all mysteries and have not charity, I'm nothing. I knew when I, this verse really was the one that got me to begin with, but I knew something. I was not operating in charity. I was operating in pride. I was operating in self. Okay. He says, verse 3, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now, the world's definition of charity is bestowing all your goods to the poor. But that ain't charity here, is it? Can I bestow my goods to the poor and it have nothing to do with God? Yes, you do it all the time. Me and Lexi were behind a truck yesterday, and I saw a guy that's done just this. He had bumper stickers all over his truck about what he was kin to the earth and loved the trees. He even had a bumper sticker that said, I'm a, dirt a, a, dirt, I'm a tree hugging dirt worshiper on his tag there, right? 
Notice that man would just he wouldn't he wouldn't harm a flea but say Jesus Christ around him and watch what would happen. Mm -hmm. You get a violent reaction from him. Okay? You get offended. You get offended. So then what is Paul saying has got to be the motivating factor behind everything that we do in Christ? Charity. Charity. Okay? And remember, charity doesn't just mean given to the poor. Charity is the love of Christ. If Jesus Christ is not the source of the thing that you're looking to do, what's going to happen with it? Yeah. Nothing godly. It might succeed worldly. God of this world's behind it. It'll succeed in this world. But if Jesus Christ is not the motivating force behind that thing which you're considering doing, don't do it. It's really that simple. If we would just ask ourselves these things. Okay, let's look at one more in, in line with this one. Go to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. What is vainglory? How about, how about if I said this way? All glory that doesn't go to the Lord. Is that vainglory? Yeah. If I get any glory to myself, you know how long it'll last? It won't last long, will it? Won't last long. Alright? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. And that ain't the fake lowliness that the world puts on. True lowliness of mind doesn't let anybody know that you're lowly. You just walk as you always walk. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I had a, a family member that actually said, would use this verse and said that that meant he'd look at your stuff and... If he wanted it, God would give it to him. Is that what he's talking about? No. no. What in the world is he saying here? If I would sum up charity, how do I know if the thing I'm about to do is charitable or not? Well, I'll show you. Go over to uh, Romans 15. Romans 15, 2. Romans 15, 2 says, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. How is this thing I'm fixing to do going to affect this person? There's your answer. How is it going to affect them? Hey, it might be about to offend them. But if it's going to offend them into seeing the cross, offend them. Yeah. It might be that the thing that you're about to say to that person seems so kind and so charitable, but it might be a big stumbling block. Yeah. He, I would, we was at class one more. I can't remember if Chris was there or not. We was at class one time and there was a lady uh, that was under conviction. It, there's a group of ladies that come in that Monday morning class and that yeah, I, I'm so thankful to the Lord for these ladies. There's several of them there that are just, you can just see that they're learning about the Lord. Yeah. Anyway, one of them was under conviction. And you could tell, and she said, you know what? If what you're saying is true here, she said, I, I'm, I'm worried. That I, you know, I'm, I think I've been saved all this time, but I, I've never heard this. She never even heard the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. You know what the lady next to her leaned over in a fit of uh, public charity and said? Oh, honey, you, yes, you are. It'll be okay. Oh, you're okay. No. Now, y'all think about that for a minute. Was that the right thing no. to say? Mm -hmm. That seems like worldly charity and worldly love. And folks, that ain't God's love. That, that was a distraction. That took that woman's mind off of that and it put her at comfort. She didn't need comfort. He, I, I like it. The old guy I like to listen to says all the time, Lord, if there's anybody listening today that's never trusted you, I pray you give them complete restlessness. Amen. Make them miserable if they've never trusted the Lord. That misery might bring them to the Lord. All right, so then even though something might look charitable, charitable to the Word, and it might sound kind, every one of these that we're talking about, Satan has a counterfeit, right? How do you know if it's the real thing, the real charity, or it's really for another person's edification? Now, what that uh, lady got told, 
did that build that lady up in the Lord, or did it distract her? It distracted. It distracted. Right. How? What would we do? How would we know that that particular statement was not from the Holy Spirit? Because it took that lady's mind off the cross, didn't it? You know, me and you all the time will th just think in conversation. You, I know I'm not the only one that's about to say something, and in the inside, that still small voice says to you, you know what, that, don't even say that. That's foolish and all that. That could be misunderstood. Just don't say it. If you say that, all that's going to do is the reason you would say that. Your motivation for saying that is to tear down a brother or sister in Christ. Don't say that to make him look foolish. Just shut up about it. Don't do that thing. Don't draw attention to this person's shortcoming. You've got all your own shortcomings. Everything we do and say, we need to think about Christ and His body and how is this going to affect. Would the Holy Spirit of God ever lead you to gossip about another human being to their detriment? No. Then you know that ain't from the Lord. If you've got something you're about to say, if it ain't going to build them up, leave it alone. Why tear them down? There but one reason that me and you, like all of us, I find that when I'm about to say something negative, if I'll stop, bite my tongue for a minute. Lexi's got her a sewing machine, and George asked her, he had a project for her. She said, okay. He said, would you sew my mouth shut? <laughs> hey, that's a good thing. Isn't it? If you're about to say something negative, if you will stop before you say it, thinking it's just it won't do any harm yet, it's going to harm you. Think about the motivation. I bet you nine times out of ten, if it's negative, your motivation is going to be to build yourself up. And the quickest way we human beings want to build ourselves up is to tear Just down those around us. Right? Now, one more verse. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10. 23. Paul said, all things are lawful for me. Could Paul do whatever he wanted to do? Yep. Can you? Yep. Can you do it if you're yep. saved and be happy no. about it? No. Nope. You can do it, but will the Lord let you remain happy in it? Mm -hmm. I bet I'm not the only one here that's had different habits and things you're doing. and You know in your mind, this ain't the thing to do, but you do it anyway. But do you really enjoy it? Yeah. No. You lay in bed that night and you think, well, what's wrong with me? Why, you know, it eats at you. Yes, it Why is. is that? Because, he's, because the Holy he's Spirit's Spirit. working on you, yeah. folks. The Holy Spirit is not going to let you remain in that thing. He's going to keep. Now, you can remain in it the rest of your life, but will you have happiness in it the rest no. of your life? He, uh, a friend was telling me one night that he's just, he said, I, I can't get rid of this nagging feeling. He said, I don't know what it is. He said, I'm starting to even wonder if I'm really saved or not. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he started telling me about it, and I couldn't help but just start smiling. I said, it, it, do you think a lost person would be concerned about the things you're telling me? He wasn't doing it for attention. It was off to the side quietly. I said, this is the Holy Spirit beginning to prick your heart about this thing. I said, just go to the Lord with it. Trust Him. Go to the Lord. Yeah. Another guy said, well, uh, you know, I used, to, I used to really like witnessing for people, but this last six months, I just really completely just find I'm not doing it anymore. I don't know why, but I quit ever talking to anybody about the Lord. I say, well, when did this take place? Ever since Christmas. Well, what happened just before Christmas? Uh, well, let's see, just before Christmas, I started drinking again. Mm. Well, there you go. Mm. That, there she, right? I was telling uh, Mr. Al a story about when I started lifting weights again. About four or five years ago, I started lifting weights again. And within a couple days, I could not study. I'd st I put in the time, but my mind, it was distracted. I could couldn't not it. study. Yeah. I couldn't retain it. Nothing was coming to me. No understanding. You know why? I started working out again. He said, there's nothing wrong with working out. No, there ain't nothing wrong with you working out, but there's something wrong with an obsessive, compulsive, former steroid dealer working out. <laughs> there's something wrong with that. Yeah. It? it immediately becomes the center of your life. Yeah. Well, what happens when anything is the center of your life except for Jesus Christ? Here, the, the drought comes. The rain shut off. And, yeah. they, and it doesn't mean you lost. It means God's going to have to chastise you and correct you. What's the first thing a father does when he chastises his son? He speaks to him. If the word doesn't correct him, then it gets a little worse, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing God does when he's going to chastise us is his word corrects us. 
if we won't listen to his word. I never once heard my granny say, do this thing, quit that, quit that, quit that, quit no. that. Never heard her say that. She said quit it one time and after that there wasn't no more. Y'all ever heard a parent doing that? Yeah. 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 Hey, would you stop that? Would you? Me and Lexi was in Coles the other day, and this poor lady had this little girl, and she said, "Don't touch that! Don't touch that! Don't touch that!" Everywhere we were going, right? Me crazy. Yeah, she was just this poor little. And I'm thinking this girl's about seven or eight. I asked the lady out on flip flops. I said, "You want to borrow my flip flops?" She said, "Boy, I'd like to." And I, well, she'd go to jail today. Oh, yeah. But the thing is, God doesn't say it over and over. Yeah. God's word will prick you, convict you, and then, folks, God is done communicating with you on that subject. Now, your conscience will keep working, but could you expect the Lord to continually reveal His will in something when you obstinately won't perform no. His will? No. That's back to where we started. If a man will, if his will is to do God's will, God will make the thing known to him. If you go to God in prayer, and before you ever went to God in prayer, if your first thing went, Lord... Whatever it is that you answer, whatever it is that you, that's the thing I'm going to do, God will deal with you. If you pray and say, Lord, don't do this, forget about it, the Lord ain't involved. Okay? Now one more verse there, verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Now how this thing that I'm asking the Lord, if it's his will, how is this going to affect the person that I'm interacting with? Alright, so here's our checklist. Is it according to the Word of God? If it is, is it according to something that's going to glorify Him? Or will it make shame on His name? How does it center on His cross? Just preaching the name Jesus Christ isn't going to do anything if you're preaching the wrong gospel. He said, or I said again, how does it bear on His name? Physically, somebody watching you, you're about to do something, is it going to say Christ in you to hope of glory? Is it going to say hypocrite? Next thing, charity. Is my motivation in this thing charity? Is it self-promotion or is it trying to edify another person? And that would be the last one. Everything we do, we need to think, how is this not only going to affect the name of Christ? How is it going to affect this person? Will it build them up in Christ or will it tear them down? And if we just operate according to those, God will direct us on this will. I guarantee you, no matter what the thing is, just go to the Lord with it. All right, thank you.